Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this webinar on the topic of dentistry after COVID-19, where the focus will be very much on new technological approaches to managing cross-infection control, particularly in regards to clean air technologies. We have a mixed panel today of clinicians plus people from industry, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. For those of you who don't know me, I am Mark Ronshaw. I'm a private dentist with a practice in Cowes, Isle of Wight. Apart from my practice, I'm also an academic professor involved in teaching the Oral Laser Masters Programme at the University of Genoa. Plus, together with my colleague, Professor Stephen Parker, we run a training academy associated with dental lasers. We have here also Mr. Richard Greenwood. Richard is the director of a, a highly innovative company that manufactures a clean air system. His company, Radic8, is rapidly turning into a world leader in terms of clean air technology. We're also joined by Mr. Nathan Wood. Nathan, apart from his work associated with his own company, for which he is a, a director, um, is a member of the British Engineering uh, Services Association where he sits as the chair um, on the Wellbeing and Buildings Committee, which is an advisory body to the British Standards Institute. He's also a chair of a European group, which is GCP Europe, which advises European associations and all aspects of internal environmental quality. I thought before we started, it would help if we put things into a degree of perspective. As I'm sure we're all acutely conscious, we're currently faced with a worldwide pandemic of an airborne uncontact transmission virus. At the time I compiled these slides, there were 1.25 million cases worldwide. And regrettably, over the couple of days since I compiled the slide, that's already increased to 1.6 million. And this is clearly a highly infectious and transmissible uh, disease which is spreading rapidly across the globe. The uh, and degree of infection in part is associated with its capacity to be transmitted through both contact as well as in airborne. And it's the airborne aspects which I think are particularly of note today. At present, there is no vaccine and it will be at least four to six months before a vaccine may become available. In order to do any kind of test, we're looking at doing uh, polymerase cha chain reactions which can take anything up to two to three days to give you a result back. Here in the UK there is very limited capacity uh, to deal with tests and although that's being expanded rapidly it's very difficult to gain access to find out whether you yourself or a patient or anyone else for that matter um, has been in contact with the virus, is immune or alternatively has the condition or otherwise is at risk and all the other tests are in development such as these antibody antigen tests it may well be quite some time unfortunately before uh, they pass the necessary regulatory steps to become available uh, as useful um, uh, uh, tests for us to use to identify uh, patients who may or may not be uh, a risk uh, to um, themselves and to others. In respect to the virus itself the pathogenesis of this is such that inside enclosed environments, particularly a dental environment, where we're also generating aerosol sprays, uh, this is a, a very uh, risky environment. In the absence of a vaccine or effective rep uh, repertoire of drugs to treat, and in view of the potential hazard to ourselves and to our staff, as well as to some of our more vulnerable patients, we are regrettably obliged, um, along with many other practices globally, uh, to close down um, pending a reduction in the incidence as well as in the prevalence of uh, this highly infectious disease. So clearly we're looking for new answers and new approaches in order for us to return to work. The um, further issue is that this particular virus, it seems to be an, a, a, a virus that likes an acidic environment um, in patients who've got poor perfusion of tissues, for instance, patients who've got respiratory disorders or perhaps patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, these are high risk uh, uh, patients uh, because the virus seems to prefer 
um, anaerobic and an acidic environment in order to invade. Um, also, of course, there are many other higher risk groups, particularly among, for instance, asthmatics, patients with diabetes, perhaps patients who are undergoing cancer chemotherapies, uh, amongst others, uh, um, including elderly patients who may be immunocompromised. Because of the very high risk associated with the dental environment, this is something where we're very much restricted in what we can do in practice. The economic consequences of this are such that worldwide we're currently facing a short, sharp recession. And although it would appear that the uh, prospect for a rapid recovery is reasonable, here in the UK it may well be spring to summer next year before we've fully recovered uh, from the economic shock. And so this poses a challenge to the economy at large, not just in, um, in dentistry. This particular um, uh, virus is perhaps something we should have been better prepared for because if you go back a century, there is history attached to this. In, the, in 1918, it was identified towards the end of the war that there are troops in the trenches who are suffering from a highly uh, infectious flu, which then became known as the Spanish flu. This rapidly spread worldwide, leading to 500 million cases worldwide Regrettably, it's estimated that approximately 10% of those, about 50 million people, uh, were casualties of it. Again, they had no vaccine, and at that time, they didn't have any of antibiotics or modern drugs to treat. The policy at the time, because they found that institutionalised patients seemed to have a very poor uh, prognosis, was to build outdoor tented hospitals as temporary affairs and here the uh, results were very much enhanced and it was associated with a reduced uh, mobility and mortality of the patients and also most notably a reduced incidence of uh, infection among the secondary care workers. Here's an image from the archives of the Centre for Disease Control and you can see that these 1920s nurses are wearing personal protective equipment which is not so very dissimilar to what we see today. And the, even these improvised masks in an outdoor environment seem to offer a very good level of protection to the extent that although this had a higher affinity for younger patients, um, the incidence of cross-infection to secondary care workers was less than perhaps we're seeing today. So maybe there are lessons here that have yet to be learned. Um, the uh, issue in regards to um, uh, protecting the public led to all sorts of novel um, solutions being proposed, some of which may seem uh, rather strange to modern eyes. I mean, eat more onions. Well, I suppose that would definitely encourage social distancing. And as for the idea of eating more candy, well, from a dental point of view, of course, I, I have uh, an opinion on it. But in the absence of, uh, of other steps to take, people were just desperately looking for um, uh, a solution. When you look at uh, uh, the issue, it's in part because this virus can be carried in microparticles, which can be generated even in speech. These one to three micron particles are so light they can persist in the air for long periods of time, and it can be anything up to several hours before they settle. If somebody sneezes, the heavier particles fall to the floor, but these lighter particles can disseminate and spread over a very large area before finally settling in contaminating surfaces where they can be viable for anything up to several days after the event. So given the nature of the problem in dentistry, we have a, a, a compounding factor in that we're using devices that generate an aerosol spray, and that aerosol spray in itself assist the spread of any infected air plus any infected materials present in the patient's um, oral cavity and in consequence you can have quite large areas of, of space particularly in open plan surgeries where it can spread to up to over 30 feet and absolutely everything gets infected. One solution is simply to improve ventilation because by improving ventilation this dilutes these uh, very small particle uh, size Disinfection by UVC and HEPA filters can selectively remove and clean air in a single pass, 
which in the enclosed confines of our surgeries, as well as our waiting areas, would seem to offer us the potential for a way forward. So as part of our revised protocols to do with both our personal protection equipment, as well as our processes in standing operating procedures, there are very many considerations, such as possibly using devices to reduce the aerosol generated particulate matter, disinfectants, rubber dam, isolite, as well as the equipment and uh, the protective gear that we're wearing. But as part of the novel approaches, perhaps clean air technology also offers us a way forward um, because with the potential risk associated with transmission with this particular virus for our highly vulnerable patients, we are very much in need of a novel approach. At this point, I'd like to talk to Richard Greenwood. Richard, what got you first interested in this type of technology? I uh, started to look quite deeply at the clean air technology space. Um, this coincided with my father developing quite bad COPD, and I looked for a technology that was more than just a filtration uh, solution. Eventually, I found a company in South Korea called INB Air, we're now partners, the Radicate INB Air Group. And INB Air set up the virus killer technology way back in 2004. This was as a result of SARS pandemic. And they were sponsored by the South Korean government to create a technology that could tackle um, airborne uh, and droplet disease transmission routes, specifically looking at viruses. Um, I thought this was uh, the best technology that I'd seen and um, joined them in order to expand the product range and really to globalize the technology outside of South Korea. And this was back in, in 2017. In South Korea, I mean, South Korea is being hailed as the, the number one country right now for flattening the coronavirus curve. And, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, technology does play a part in this. In South Korea, we have uh, 370,000 commercial installations of the virus killer technology. We have a presence in over 82% of hospitals, uh, most government buildings, uh, the COVID-19 task force offices uh, all use our technology. Um, really now, what we're very, very passionate about is trying to get this technology being used in other countries and also trying to increase infection control by bringing in a technology that is combating uh, airborne and droplet disease transmission routes. So if I can share my screen with you um, here. So it, the problem, we all know this, uh, there's four disease transmission routes and what's becoming very apparent at the moment is that we need to pay more attention to airborne and droplet disease transmission routes. And how do you do that? Well, first and foremost, it's very important to control the flow of air. What Mark showed on, on a couple of his slides earlier is that the fine droplets will hang around the airspace. But if you've got a forced airflow, you can control where those droplets are. And ideally, what you want to do is take those droplets out of the breathing zone and then process them in, in some way. In, in our technology, we kill viruses. So you'll see here, how does the technology work? Stage one is purification. This is done via filters. Um, a common air purifier you'll find on the, on, the, on the market is a purification device, filters and a fan in a box. The issue really is that filters, including HEPA filters, they're not designed to trap particles as small as viruses. So they will have an effect, but they won't be totally effective. For that, you need the second part, which is sterilization. In our technology, we have multiple ultraviolet lights and something called titanium dioxide, which creates a process called photocatalytic oxidation. So we have a chamber inside our technology um, that oxidizes and uses ultraviolet radiation to kill viruses. Uh, it's not there just to kill viruses. Any nanoparticle that gets through the filters gets destroyed in, a, in our reactor chamber. 
So you'll see here, how does it compare to, to the standard filters? Well, you've got dust, particulate matter, allergens, mold. You can trap all of those. VOCs and gases, well, they, they, you can use carbon filters, but they can very quickly leach back into, into the environment and become a problem. And what the radicate units do with this uh, double combination of the clean air photocatalytic oxidation technology and air purification with filters is deal with all forms of air pollution. And, and if in a simple way, you break this down into sick air, toxic air from gases and VOCs, and then dirty air, which is particulate matter. So the second part to this is that in order for us to say we are virus killer technology, uh, we have done the test to show on a single air pass, what can we kill, what can we destroy? And in South Korea, we work with various uh, government institutions and uh, universities. Um, and you'll see here the virus killer test results. We tested on coronavirus, adenovirus, influenza virus, and polio virus. And what went in to what comes out is no detection left. So we give a kill rate on a single air pass of 99.9999% various different uh, 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 accreditations there. And just coming on to the units, you'll see here filters, fan, and reactor chamber. It's the same in all of our units. The only difference is the size of the reactor chamber in accordance with the amount of airflow we're pushing through the units. What I'm showing you here is a virus killer VK401 wall mounted unit. This is very, common uh, uh, for dentist laboratories. It gives enough airflow. It can go up on the wall, which means it can be positioned within a dental lab in order to try and take the airflow away from the dentist, the dentist assistant and the patient. And the airflow, as I said at the beginning of this, is a very important part. If if the airflow is not correct, you're not getting rid of those ultrafine particles or those aerosolized particles. Okay, Richard, can I ask you a question at this point? Um, um, we've had a number of questions come in from our audience, and um, they, they were saying that um, they wondered if um, uh, there are any studies that um, you might be able to share. And also, they were saying that there'd been a Canadian trial of Radicate. And um, would you be able to mention something um, um, about that? Because uh, that's a popular theme in the questions coming in. Because um, another question was, ask, was asking if you had anything specific um, to uh, the, um, uh, the coronavirus. Well, it, it, that's, that's exactly what we're doing now in, in Canada. So we are testing our technology in a, uh, a simulation uh, uh, laboratory and we're simulating a real life uh, installation. So that, that brings in airflow and, and we're using a bacteriophage of uh, simulation again of coronavirus. And what we want to show with this is how quickly we can deal with aerosolized particles in a simulated healthcare setting. We're expecting the, the first results from uh, that test next week. Um, this is done under EPA guidelines, this testing. And what we're also wanting to test there is we're going to run a test on this biophage, uh, bacteria biophage, with how much less surface settlement, so surface contamination, you also get in a, in a simulated environment utilizing uh, our virus killer technology. So okay. I'm hoping that by the end of next week, we'll have the first lot of those test results. Excellent. And because uh, you've been manufacturing and um, supplying these units for some years, haven't you, including in South Korea? That's right. We have 370,000 commercial installations in South Korea. So currently we manufacture all the units in South Korea. Uh, we are setting up currently as well a manufacturing facility in the UK and looking to do that in the US as well. Nathan, if I may ask you a question, how practical do you think this type of clean air technology is to the very busy working environment that we associate uh, with our dental practices? Uh, 
I see them as being extremely practical. Um, there's no limitation on their on their application, if you like, from uh, vehicles to offices to uh, <coughs> dentists, food industry, um, because they don't just deal with viruses. They deal with with air pollution uh, as well as Richard's explained from VOCs, PM two point five. Um, it, it, it ticks all of the boxes in terms of what us as an industry and, and, the, and the bodies are looking at that can um, deal with the common known issues of air pollution and then the world that we find ourselves living in now in the terms of the threat of viruses uh, and pandemics. So the technologies that are coming through, there's not many that carry the weight that the Eradicate equipment does in terms of the testing and how long they've been on the market. Um, I've, been, I've been receiving almost daily emails of new bits of kit and technology that have been pulled out of the archive that might have an influence over viruses with some clever, clever branding and wording associated. Um, but it's the longevity of the products that also excites us and the fact that how many is out there in South Korea. So we've um, we've spoken about it length during our our committee meetings, uh, and and part of that committee are other manufacturers in the ventilation world, um, and they can't come near it. So there's although there's uh, there's a need uh, for for clean air tech. There, this this is all already there. It's just, it's readily available. So in terms of of needing case studies, I mean I, I've even carried out case studies with this equipment and and some competitors equipment as well in real life scenarios. And I think that's what carries the weight with it. Um, we've not just spoken about it and looked into the technology and dug into it ourselves. We've used it in, in, uh, in known polluted schools, one of Seacon's top 50 polluted schools in London. We, uh, we managed to use some of Richard's technology uh, and flatline the ingress of NO2. So in terms of uh, what we can test with it, or what I can test with it or my team can test with it, we, we can't muck around with viruses, uh, but we can certainly look at what the what the uh, the claims are for the technology in terms of uh, reducing air pollution, uh, and it and it does exactly that. So yeah, it, it's it's not just for dental practices NHS, but it has it has a fantastic uh, ability to help with the, the current pandemic. Okay, coming back to you, Richard, we've had a couple of questions come in, which no doubt you were going to answer um, uh, in due course. But uh, uh, one of the um, recurrent themes is how long does it take uh, to decontaminate um, uh, the air in the room? Um, what sort of time would it take between patients um, if one of these was installed in the standard room um, um, in a dental surgery? before it would be then safe for the ingress of the next patient, um, having um, uh, uh, changed, presumably, the air uh, that had been um, contaminated. So this is about room air exchanges. And, and generally, um, in a general setting, say in a school, they'll want to achieve three air exchanges an hour. In a, in a dental setting, you'll want to try and achieve much more than that. Fortunately, um, Dental surgeries are quite small. Uh, the units that we install in dental surgeries will recommend most of the time the 401 units are very quiet. So they can be on full fan power without taking, uh, without creating any, any kind of unnecessary noise. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Richard. Um, so in terms of time, that's not so much a, of an issue, but I mean, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, where to locate it, does that matter? I mean, can it be on the wall? Does it need to be at the patient's feet? Um, does it need to be on the ceiling? Um, because, I mean, air um, flow is a, a significant issue because you might clear a band of air um, in and around the top of the room. But, I mean, is it really truly swapping all the air um, uh, in the room? And the auxiliary question to that, and these have come from our, um, uh, our webinar um, our audience, is um, does aircon make a difference? Is it a problem? And, um, and uh, uh, is it something which is going to interfere uh, with uh, the product? So all of those are, are great questions because everything you're doing with air inputs or air outputs makes a difference. Um, rooms are naturally ventilated. Um, it's important where the unit is sited, yes. Because, as I said earlier, ideally you want to be dragging that, that air away from you uh, as a dentist, uh, away from the dental assistant and, and the patient. 
And we generally, if it's possible, say, to house the unit in front of the dental chair. It, it, there is a bit of common sense, I'd say here. Nathan, Nathan as a, a ventilation specialist, have you got anything to add there? Certainly with, with incoming air from air conditioning. Yeah, it's, it, airflow is, is, is so important. So I don't think there's, uh, there's no one simple fix. I mean, as much as these units um, positioned in a certain applications uh, in various dentists it may not be possible in other dentists. I've seen some comments come up to say that they've got a window at the foot of, uh, uh, of their patients and stuff. So it's when you're looking at how ventilation systems such as air conditioning uh, and, and the VK systems are, you, you need to take that into consideration in the positioning of the unit and how the airflow is. I mean, I've, we've actually used some basic sort of desktop fans to actually use uh, to, to guide the air towards the units as well. Um, so yes, airflow is critical, um, but it's quite simple because normally within, certainly the, the dentist that I've been to, and there are not a lot, um, is that it's it's normally a relatively small space, um, generally just one window. The ones that I've been to as well are normally naturally ventilated. So there's a lot more, like I might touch on in a second as well, in terms of the other pollutants, but certainly airflow is a, a big consideration to take. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we've had a, a couple of other um, questions come in, um, Richard, um, concerning um, um, where these units need to be sited. People have been asking, and you've shown some pictures there of waiting areas and um, other um, areas. So, um, for um, um, a dental surgery which has got um, uh, multiple operatories, um, I guess you're looking at um, uh, a unit per room, plus there's going to have something to cover the common areas. W would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's right. So it, it, because dental surgeries are fairly small, um, you're getting a good airflow air exchange with uh, something like a VK401 unit. Um, it's also quite dexterous with being able to site it where you need to. Uh, you could also site that unit on the ceiling, um, but they are quite heavy units. So, so you know, do that, do that with caution. Um, it depends how big the, the common areas are or the waiting areas. You can see the image here. We tend to put tower units into waiting areas. Um, what we try and do with that is to drag then the contaminated air down to the ground and recycle fresh air above seated head height. So again, getting that right airflow so that if there is any virus uh, uh, being shredded, uh, shedded by somebody, then we're controlling it and taking it straight down to the ground. So even if you are getting a, a, an air exchange every five minutes, the first part in this is move it away from people, take it out of the breathing zone. So if you've got a smaller waiting area, a VK401 is absolutely fine. And then you need to think about where's that sited as well. So, so ideally above head height or, or low. So you're taking the air up and out of the breathing zone or down below table height and out of the breathing zone. Yeah, one of the um, um, participants to the webinar asked about droplet size because presumably larger droplets like might be generated from an aerosol generated uh, um, spray with an air rotor and ultrasonic scaler um, are going to end up um, low down landing on surfaces. So it's not going to have any impact on there. It's purely for air isn't it? And uh, um, so um, uh, do you have any um, um, suggestions of complementary um, uh, processes that um, you would recommend in association with um, uh, air cleaning technology in order to better help us manage um, this uh, added um, potential cross infection hazard? Well, this is, this is something else that we looked at in detail. And the reason uh, for this is twofold. One is that common cleaning products are, are greatly polluting the air. So if you use a chemical or a quat compound, then it's staying in the air. And we, we saw this in not only hospitals, but schools, for example, where uh, the worst air pollution was when the cleaners were in. And um, I spent a couple of years researching what are the best things for surfaces. And we, we have hence been working with some probiotic experts and some microbiologists 
and we've launched a, a, a product line of probiotic cleaning products. Um, just uh, at the end of last year, we did some trials with a company in the UK called Bunzel, and we uh, tested surfaces with a big brand antimicrobial cleaning product against our probiotic cleaning products. And what we found is that, and I think dentists will be quite familiar with this, is that as we're changing the biofilm to a healthy microflora layer with probiotics, the hygiene levels just kept increasing. And at the end of a one month trial, we, we took uh, on, I think maybe 12 touch points in and around an elder care facility. We took all of those uh, and increased the hygiene levels by over 90%, so, so 90% less pathogens. So uh, very much an advocate of probiotic cleaning products. We have a, a probiotic cleaning product division um, and, quite something to change that mindset from kill to clean to to bring to life to really clean. Probiotics also will carry on cleaning for about 72 hours once they're applied. And I suppose that real big shift comes into play that you're not killing pathogens that are on surfaces, you're outcompeting them. So you're making it an inhostile area for for pathogens to to be certainly multiply with germs um, and also we know that viruses can create biofilm as well as bacteria they can't do that because that healthy microflora layer is already there so uh, there are some interesting studies and white papers that have been done with probiotics in in various different health settings including one i saw um, in the uae within dentistry uh, and I'm I, I'm more than happy to share those with you, Mark. You can share them with people in the group. That's very interesting because, I mean, pathogen resistance is a big problem, um, generally, whether it's antibiotics or whether it's inside a clean environment. And so novel approaches such as probiotics are things, things I'm quite empathetic with, although clearly we'd have to have a look at um, uh, the um, uh, the evidence date. Now, we've had a number of other questions that have come in, and um, um, we can throw this out to the panel. Um, one question was, well, if this technology is so good, why is it in all the intensive care units? Well, it, it, in South Korea it is. So if I can, excuse me for this, uh, uh, I'll do it as quick as I can. So if I can go back to the products here. Um, we've actually designed some, some uh, new products that can create positive pressure and negative pressure as well. Uh, we've been asked by this this for, for the medical sector, but also um, by a few dentists. So here you'll see uh, a negative pressure system. What's very important with negative pressure, for example, is um, you don't want to take a problem and put that problem somewhere else. For us, we want to take out a problem, kill that problem within the unit, and then release air and it's safe. So, so this means a negative pressure system with this kind of sterilization or level of sterilization, you, you don't have to release to ambient, you could release it wherever you liked. We are working with a number of um, COVID-19 task forces with some of these applications right now for negative pressure containment isolation uh, areas. Um, and here you can see we've done the same thing, but for positive pressure. So. The laminar airflow that, that we get from a VK Medi unit like this, for example, it's important because we've seen that laminar airflow when it comes from the ceiling, certainly in an operating theater, that the, the wound site is quite often covered by the, the surgeon. So that laminar airflow is not having that effect. So they're changing this. And again, with, with this South, South Korea, as it, with a lot of things to do with infection control, the lead in the way. And we have installed this system now in, in multiple, multiple hospitals. The big difference again with this is the right kind of laminar airflow. So airflow is really important, but then as well as filtering out the air, it's being sterilized. So you're catching the bacteria, the mold, the fungi in the filters, and we're killing the viruses in the sterilization chamber. That's, that's great. Um, uh, just moving on, um, quite a few people are asking about maintenance issues in regards to um, uh, how frequently things like filters may need attention, um, the longevity of the product, 
about um, the kind of running costs that are involved um, uh, with something like this, um, because um, um, uh, clearly this is a technology that could be of interest to, uh, to, to many of the people um, watching. So can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Of course. So uh, as with all filtration products, the filters need changing. Um, on the VK401 unit, which, which really is, is the model for dentists, the HEPA filter needs changing every 2,000 hours. So that depends on the runtime. Um, all the reactor chambers in all the systems are 8,000 hour runtimes until they need changing. On an eight hour day, that's three years. Um, so one of the things we do as a company is if you buy an air purifier, and I'm not going to mention names, the filters are hugely expensive. So the average price of a HEPA filter on the market is over £100. The HEPA filter in our VK401 system is £25. So we're not, we're not selling units and then we've got people uh, who have to then come and buy our expensive filters. We try and make this technology as affordable as possible. And, and that runs throughout the whole of this. So a 401 unit is £1,000 plus VAT. That's the recommended retail price. When we show some of our systems to, to doctors, if they think it's a piece of medical technology, the system that you can see on the screen right there, people generally say is it, it's about 50,000 pounds, but that's a 2,000 pounds machine. So we try and make this affordable because we want, to, we want to get the numbers out there. And it's also, a reflection of our passion for, 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 for clean air technology. And um, uh, is that a particularly costly um, and complex thing? Is it a factory return or is it something that um, um, uh, is used by the user? I mean, is there a need for a service engineer to come out and uh, uh, attend to the equipment? So the reactor chambers are pretty simple uh, change. Um, uh, what we're seeing is we're being asked for um, units to, to be leased so a package of units and then, and then a leasing package. I think with that, we would offer a, a fully maintained package so that what the, the filters are so easy to change, it, it takes seconds, but the reactor chamber needs the, the unit opening up and the reactor cell itself completely changing. Um, it probably is about a 15 minute task, um, uh, but it's, it's down to the degree of competence of the, of the person doing it. We do have instructional videos available for for changing the reactor chamber. And in a 401 unit, the reactor cell, which I think an average of three years, you can say before a change, um, is uh, 150, 150 pounds. Richard, can I ask you, there are many other products that are on the market. Um, how do you find they compare? Uh, for example, the Philips unit has got a, uh, um, an active carbon filter. There are air ionizers and devices like this. I mean, what points of difference uh, are, do you think are significant in respect of these technologies? Yeah, I mean, very important point here is that it depends what you're buying the piece of technology for. So a, a simple filtration product is very good at collecting particles. Um, for gases, activated carbon filters in in an unstable or a stable equilibrium. So we'll trap gases and get filled maybe to 10% of the recommended change time. Then it, it, the gases are passing through that filter. So, so I suppose without getting too technical, the other thing that we do within our chambers is we put that activated carbon in an unstable equilibrium which gives it about 20 times the lifespan because anything you, you're trapping in the activated carbon, you're then dealing with, with the photocatalytic oxidation uh, uh, process as well. So uh, we can't compare ourselves to an air purifier. We use filters before the fan, but the real technology for me is what happens in that photocatalytic chamber. Um, there are some other technologies out there on the market we haven't found anything that has test results like ours on a single air pass for, for virus destruction. So I suppose the answer is it really depends what you're trying to solve um, and how much technology you want uh, within your surgery. Okay, so in terms of disposal of filters, would these be regarded as clinical waste? 
No. Um, it, 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 another good question. So with our filters, there's a certain amount of UV light shining onto the filter, which keeps it healthy. Um, this is this is a growing concern in 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 industry, and I think Nathan, you should probably touch on this about sick filter syn syndrome, because we do replace a lot of common air purifiers with our technology because people are saying they they get a moldy smell or something from from an air purifier, mm -hmm. and contamination microbial contamination can grow on a filter <laughs> within two weeks of it being installed. So so it's a very good point. Yeah, if, if, if it's okay, I'll step in. Um, I, I've, I'll touch on it a little more in, in, in a second, but I've worked in ventilation and ventilation systems, uh, domestic, commercial and, and industrial for around 18 years. Um, and there's been a, a huge shift more recently um, surrounding uh, air, uh, air filters, the quality of the filter, standard of the filter the testing procedure of the filter um, and the the recommended intervals in which manufacturers state that the filters need changing um, we're also just before covid we're also looking at the uh, the tolerances of filters how they actually fit into the machines um, what the seals are like what what air can pass around the filter rather than through the filter so in terms of when a filter is collecting dust, pollen, um, bacteria, gases, if it's, if it's carbon. Again, and what Richard touched on was the fact that because the UV light is able to penetrate back through the filter, it keeps it cleaner for longer breaking down those particulates and then dealing with them at the later stage of the chamber. But in terms of bacteria within filters, I think I'm right in saying, Richard, around 20% of dust is microbial anyway. So if the filter does get dirty for a long period of time, eventually that filter breaks down and then the dust uh, or whatever's been captured within the filter can actually penetrate through and, and carry on. So in standard systems, um, the, the, the filter's job is, is pointless as it's just carrying on straight through, through the system into the area that it's serving. But with the Radicate technology, you've got this reactor chamber afterwards as well. Okay. So the intervals of, 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 of health and hygiene surrounding ventilation systems is a very hot topic. Nathan, can I ask you, is it necessary to have a negative or positive pressure system for a dental surgery? I know a lot about ventilation. I don't know a great deal about ventilation systems within uh, dentists. Um, but yeah, there is pros and cons. I think it depends on the type of dentistry being undertaken. Um, I know that a lot of clean rooms rely on a negative pressure as an, or, or a positive, dependent on the, the uh, where you want to keep the contaminants in a sense. Um, but if anybody has got more advanced systems within their surgeries, um, there are some inline systems available. For, so in addition to the wall mounted or the floor mounted systems, there's some, there's some very, very good inline radicate systems as well which if careful considerations taken into the resistance of adding another block of kit and filters into your existing uh, ventilation system can be taken into account, then uh, that's another option that people could look at if they have got more advanced or bigger, bigger areas to look after. And that, that, that's not a plug and play installation that would involve a ventilation company going out and installing it. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of complexity of installation, um, um, do you recommend that um, there's a survey or should they just be ordered off the peg and uh, um, installed ourselves? Are these particularly complex things? Um, and um, um, the practicalities of it are such that um, um, uh, other um, aspects related to the installation which pose um, a, a particular problem not for the plug and play systems. So citing the system, uh, perhaps have a little bit of advice from one of our team uh, on, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's two screws up in the wall and, and, and you hang the, the, the unit there, or it's stood on a surface. Um, larger units that we put in waiting room are cited uh, uh, plug and play units we would say that that uh, they they can be anchored to the wall quite quite easily, and and, and we do recommend that in in, in public public places. 
Um, we'll just come back now, if I if I may, back to Richard because he was going to tell us about um, uh, some test reports. Um, and uh, so, please, Richard. Um, Mark, I can see a few people asking about test results. Can I go on to a slide please. about this quickly? Sure. I've just been flicking for, through them so people can see them. Um, <coughs> but um, testing on uh, air purifiers is uh, standardized chamber testing. So all air purifiers go through the, the, the same kind of testing. It's, it's tested in, 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 in the same way. So, so that is an industry standard. Testing for um, uh, microbial pollution isn't standardized. So one of the key parts to this uh, back in 2004 when this technology was first invented was how to put these tests together. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if I've shared them with you, the test methods, Mark, but I've certainly shared them with you, uh, Andrew. Um, so again, coming back to this, the, the <coughs> National University, which is the Aerospace University, and under um, a grant from the South Korean government, and as a result of SARS, uh, this virus killer technology was invented in, in South Korea. The tests on viruses, for us to be able to say um, all respiratory viruses, we tested against poliovirus, influenza virus, adenovirus, coronavirus. The coronavirus strain was actually SARS coronavirus uh, that this was tested on. You can see some of the test results uh, here for, for the viruses themselves. And because we've tested on those different virus groups, we are comfortable going out to market saying respiratory viruses. We've also tested the core technology against uh, uh, various bacteria and fungi. Um, medical research centers, again, it, it's not a standard uh, uh, protocol or test this. So we've gone to some of the experts uh, the best experts in South Korea in order to get these tests done. Um, moving on from that, again, more uh, tests conducted on bacteria and fungi. I think the important one right now is coronavirus. So uh, we tested against SARS coronavirus on a single air pass, really, really important. No technology can have a kill rate without having a single air pass test report because if you're not catching or killing everything then you're giving it propulsion back into the into the ambient environment so single air pass test reports are really important we do have lots of other tests as well we've tested in chambers uh, we've tested against uh, various gases and pollutants here you can see some test reports of um, VOCs also the fact that we're very willing to share all these tests with anybody who wants to see them. If you go to an air purifier manufacturer and ask them to see their tests on VOCs or gases, you're likely to receive uh, a list of what activated carbon is supposed to deal with, not a test report. So I don't know if anybody knows much about South Korea, but um, it's probably it has the most stringent practices in place for being able to back up what it is you actually say you can do. Um, and certainly with something like viruses and bacteria. Richard, can I ask you at that point, uh, have you had any contact with Public Health England? And why is it then you think, um, just to ask you the question again, that um, um, IT units and um, um, other um, areas that um, are experiencing very high exposure the COVID-19 virus um, um, aren't integrating this type of technology? Well, it, it, they are. We're starting to speak to various different departments, not, not so much in the UK, uh, in, in lots of other countries. We have in Saudi Arabia, we, we've just sent a, a rushed order um, to some of the royal palaces, and this has resulted in us becoming NASCO certified, which means the armed forces and the government hospitals and um, the royal palaces and clinics. We're now on a uh, an order sheet for, for them. So we've got a little bit of a backlog of orders <coughs> because we're taking orders from lots of different countries right now. We haven't, we haven't tunnel visioned the UK We've put this out there. Uh, I think there's a lot of skepticism in the UK when it comes to technology coming to market from an unknown brand. 
Um, it is changing slightly now because South Korea has got ahead of this coronavirus curve. And so people are looking at how they've done it. And as well as good critical response from people, tracing of the virus, uh, nationwide testing, there's also technology at use. Um, from the start of this vir virus outbreak, I have been saying that I believe it's an airborne virus. And slowly but surely, it's gone from droplets to large droplets to, to fine droplets can stay in the air to now lots of studies coming out saying it's airborne. Um, so it, when I started this company in 2017, I thought, great, I'll go into the NHS because this is not only improvement in infection control, but if we can bring down the rate of healthcare associated infections, it's also a great cost saving exercise. The problem was hitting this wall of, we don't have to do anything about airborne and droplet disease transmission. It's about direct contact and indirect contact. That is changing very quickly. We are having those conversations now, COVID-19 task forces, certain NHS uh, uh, departments. Um, uh, for now, uh, as a company, we're trying to keep our head above the parapet. We're growing extremely quickly and opening up uh, uh, eradicate depots and manufacturing facilities um, because the last thing we want to do is give people hope that there is another tool in this fight. One of the questions that's been asked from the floor, Richard, is how long will it take in order to gain access to this type of technology? Because clearly there'll be a lead time for manufacture and delivery. So how long would it take for a unit suitable for a dental practice like my own? So, uh, because the VK401 unit, which is popular for dentists, um, we can get many of them on a pallet, about 34 units on a pallet. We've been flying those in cargo freight. So as soon as, as we've manufactured them and, and the, the, the factory in South Korea is open 24 hours a day at the moment, as soon as we've manufactured them, we're flying them over. And there's currently about two to three weeks uh, lead time. And we're taking back orders of those units. The small personal units like this Hextio, we're taking uh, back orders off as well. And we should have some stock of that again in about two weeks time. The larger units, the freestanding units um, need to be shipped in. So it's shipping time. We, we, we have a container uh, coming to us in about six weeks of those larger units. So uh, the 401 units, it's about a two to three week lead time right now. Can I ask you another question? Does it matter about things like having open windows or aircon units that are on simultaneous to your unit? So we get this question a lot because in, our, in all of our manuals, we say make sure that you open the windows and aerate your property. And, and, and people then ask us, well, I've, I've just cleaned all the air in my property. Why do I have to open the window? And the simple fact is you need to get oxygen inside your, your building. So it will have an effect um, because, of, because of pollution that you might be bringing in from outside. But, but good practice is good ventilation. You know, we, we need to get air changes going. So it, 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 if you've got ventilation coming in, that's also moving those particles. So it, you've just got to get the balance right, I suppose. And Nathan, being a ventilation expert, maybe you can jump in at that point. Yeah. Um, my dealing uh, with the eradicate gear and other purification devices was mainly looking at um, was mainly looking at uh, air quality in terms of non-viruses, everything but. Um, so when you're looking at um, what we term as pollution dilution, um, it does it does come into fact that it can aid a system. So in uh, thinking back, it's been a while since I've been to the dentist, um, is the fact that mine had, only has a window. There's no mechanical ventilation at all in, in the practice that I go to. So if in this instance, I was looking at a VK104, in my mind's eye, I can imagine a position where it would be whereby the natural ventilation of air coming in and going out could actually aid the performance of the unit on the wall. Um, so there needs to be a certain amount of common sense, but as I say, uh, Richard's got a really good team around him that can give advice. And that's, that's the advice that I was taking when I first pitched in with Richard 
four or five years ago now. But again, I wasn't looking at viruses. It's just the fact that we now live in a world uh, with a pandemic uh, virus that we're able to talk about these, uh, these additional benefits to the system. Okay, well, I, I think at this point, um, um, uh, we should maybe just have a, a, a quick round of final comments from each of our um, panel. Nathan, got... may I ask you, uh, with your regulatory cap on, um, where do you think we're going with this type of technology? We need to act on available technologies now. Um, standards take far too long to bring to bring into force um, 12 months two years we haven't got that time um, the trouble being as well is by the time the standards are put forward and out there medical science technology people's knowledge medical knowledge has moved on way in advance of what gets put forward recent building bulletins for health and ventilation in schools is out of date by the time it was published so people really do need to jump on and 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 go with trusted technologies such as the Radicate equipment because it does exactly what it says on the tin. I've never known a company that we've approached with information on the technology to have such a forthcoming, you know, here's our presentation, here's the documentation, this is where it's tested. Um, we fitted uh, the smaller units that the, the guys are showing you in all of our vehicles. Um, so we've got a clean air fleet uh, with eradicate technology inside it purely and initially to look after the health and well-being of our team now with the added benefit of the virus killers um, we've also got the equipment in our office which we've since donated out uh, to friends family nhs local nurseries and everything else but in terms of what you're talking about of trying to break into the nhs into the doctor's surgery getting this equipment approved the difficulty i had even in loaning one of these bits of equipment to a key worker, my neighbor is a, is a fireman. He wasn't even allowed to borrow it because of the amount of red tape and hoops that people have to jump through. But I think in the world that we're living in now, it's best practice, what is common sense and what is needed today. We can't wait, there's just no time. That, that's my, my point I'd like to put across. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Richard, um, lots of the um, uh, delegates have been asking about cost. And I know you've, um, in recognition of the difficulties we face as an industry, um, you have got um, an offer on um, the equipment. And also, we have quite a contingent from South Africa um, who are very interested indeed in this technology. And um, so uh, um, in your closing statements, could, could you just think, uh, touch on uh, aspects related to uh, um, how much these units cost and also uh, in respect of the South African community, would you be able to help them? Yes. So we are just growing our global team and um, the new global head office will be based in South Africa. So, so that's, that's good for but for South Africa, um, the unit, the most popular unit for dentists is a VK401. That, that, that is a thousand pounds plus VAT. And we have a, a, a dental only page on our Radicate website, which I'm sure we can share with you, um, uh, which is radicate.com forward slash dental. Um, and there we're offering 10% discount to, to, to dentists. This is just for dentists, so, 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 so please keep it for dentists. Um, and after speaking to quite a few dentists who were telling us of the problems that they were facing right now, we decided, you know, let's try and help out and, and put an offer on there. Um, I think also what... Uh, what, what, what I should share with you is when this started in Wuhan, we worked with Wuhan and two of the main hospitals in Wuhan, we donated a lot of equipment to. So uh, two of the biggest hospitals uh, over there are, are, are utilizing the Radicate technology. Um, we're trying to help in this situation. We are growing as a company uh, and, and largely, uh, you know, this has put a rocket under our growth um, um, but we are a company that also wants to help. So, so we will give uh, as, as good as lead times as we can give and where we can help, uh, we will help. Richard, may, at that point, um, on behalf of myself and everybody watching the webinar, and also to Nathan, and also of course to Andrew, 
um, I'd just like to thank you all for participating today. Um, I think we've covered an awful lot of ground. Hopefully, it answers, if not all, many of the, um, uh, the issues that have been raised. Um, on the screen here, you can see some contact details of the various participants. And so, if you want to email us or contact them, uh, you're most welcome. And um, um, so, uh, again, on behalf of, uh, of myself, um, all the people who are watching um, worldwide, um, this has been a most informative um, event. I'm excited that the potential this has to allow us to get back to work and as part and parcel of uh, the solution um, as a private practitioner, I can see that this is something which I certainly, for one, will definitely want to have in, um, in my practice. So congratulations on, on your product. Thank you very much indeed for your participation today, Nathan. And I'm very encouraged to hear how positive you obviously feel about it, Andrew. And so from here in Cows, I just want to thank you and I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you.